Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this discussion on framing Israel's war on Palestine, international law and people's resistance organized by the Asia-Europe People's Forum, the AEPF. My name is Shalmali Gutta, and I am with Focus on the Global South. I will moderate this discussion with my colleague, Katarine, Katarina Anastasiu, and I request Katrina, to please introduce herself and make a few opening remarks. Katrina, please. Thank you very much, Shalmali. Uh, my name is Katarina Anastasiu. I'm a facilitator for Transform Europe, where I am actually responsible for the projects we have around the topics of migration, militarization, all global strategy. Can you hear me? Somebody has to mute themselves. I'm sorry. I can listen to the voices of other people. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yes, uh, thank you. I was asked by IEPF, with whom we as Transform Europe, we collaborate uh, closely to uh, co-moderate this webinar, and I'm happy to be here with you today. Particularly later on, I will focus a little bit on how the situation is discussed and how it is, uh, let's say, bargained within European societies. I think this is where I can add a little bit uh, context. Um, the situation in Europe right now, um, I think most of you are following through the mainstream press. Um, there is a social movement uh, growing, calling for ceasefire, calling for Israel to answer for the war crimes they're committing or right now in Gaza, but it's not easy. Um, people are constantly faced uh, with the threat of being cancelled. Um, it is very difficult to choose your, your words um, if you want to make a point without being interrupted. There are countries like France where solidarity demonstrations have been banned. There are countries like Germany where the protests are actually um, very frequently led by Jewish Israeli uh, and Jewish German activists, and they're cancelled as well. Uh, so I think um, in the context of discussing the conflict today, uh, we have to shed light a little bit to this in order also to find a way to move for forward as a global community for peace. So thank you for uh, letting me co-host this webinar. And Shalmali, I give back to you to introduce our speakers, and I will um, make some remarks towards the end of our webinar again. Thank you very much, Katerina. Uh, now, today is day 34 of the siege of Gaza, with residents deprived of food, water, and fuel. Aerial bombardments and ground attacks in Gaza by the Israeli Defense Force are intensifying, and violent hostilities have spread to the West Bank. Even hospitals and refugee camps have not been spared. Latest accounts show that at least 10,569 Palestinians have been killed and 1.5 million internally displaced since October 7. In Israel, the death toll over the same period stands at a little more than 1,400. Majority of those killed are civilians, at least half are women and children. On October 27th, the UN General Assembly passed a non-binding resolution that calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and full and unhindered access to humanitarian aid in the Gaza Strip, as well as for Israel to revoke its call for Northern Gaza's evacuation. It also calls for all parties to abide by international law and for the immediate release of all civilians. The resolution, however, has had no effect in reducing bombardments and ground attacks or in protecting civilians, or in releasing any of the civilians held as hostages or prisoners. Adding fuel to the fire of these, to these atrocities is the seemingly intractable sort of polarization in public opinion about the current war and its historical context. So expressing shock and condemning the October 7th attack by Hamas on the kibbutz uh, would immediately be seen by a number as being anti-Palestinian or being against Palestinian self-determination. At the same time, voices all over the world are being silenced uh, in order who speak out against the disproportional use of violence and the atrocities being committed, not just on the Gaza Strip, but on all, all Palestine. 
the subsequent bomb continuing bombardment of and the ground attacks by the Israeli Defense Forces on Palestine, when we speak out about those, um, they are being these voices are silenced or are there are attempts to silence them. They're accused of being anti-Semitic um, and against Israel, the Israeli state. And I think as Katrina has pointed out, it's not so much a polarization as much as it is a silencing and a suppression of voices for peace, voices for self-determination, and voices for an immediate ceasefire and a cessation of hostilities. The UN Security Council has not yet been able to pass a resolution, and the crux of the disagreements are over Israel's right to defend itself versus the rights of Palestinians to self-determination and freedom from 75 years of occupation. The APF is a platform, and the views expressed in today's discussion are those of the speakers. As a platform, however, we stand for an immediate ceasefire and cessation of hostilities, and a call for urgent, adequate humanitarian assistance for all those affected, and for a peaceful, just, negotiated solution for Palestinians and Israelis to be able to live in peace and for Palestine's self-determination. We have three very eminent speakers today to guide our discussion. We have Professor Achin Vinayar, who is a retired professor of international relations in India and associate fellow at the Transnational Institute in the Netherlands. He's a social activist and writer and author of many books, including on secularism and foreign policy. We have Professor Gilbert Ashkar, or Gilbert Ashkar, as might be uh, perhaps said in uh, the UK. He's a professor of development studies and international relations at the School of Oriental and African Studies in the UK. He has authored numerous books, many of which are available in 15 languages. These include Perilous Power, the Middle East and US Foreign Policy with Noam Chomsky, uh, The Arabs and the Holocaust, The Arab-Israeli War of Narratives, and many others. And our third speaker will be Mr. Mamdu Habashi, who is a member of the Politburo of the Socialist People's Alliance Party in Egypt. He's a vice president of the former World Forum for Alternatives in Dakar and board member of the former Arab and African Research Center in Cairo, the AARC. The way we will do this dialogue today is I will ask each speaker to make, ten puts, uh, make an input of 10 minutes each. I will ask them a question and then ask the, turn the floor over to them. And then after that, we will take some questions from the floor. And then I will come back to each of the speakers for a response to the questions and other comments and closing remarks. And then we hand over to Katerina for synthesis and closing remarks. So uh, first, I have a question for Professor Achin Binayak. How is international law being adhered to or violated, not adhered to, in this war? Professor Binayak, over to you. Ten minutes, please. Thank you very much, Sharmila. Um, Let's start with recognizing that Israel is the only settler colonial apartheid state in the world today. The relationship between the two is that of the colonizer to the colonized. This is very important and of an occupier to the occupied. The occupied have the right to use military and any other means to oppose the occupation. But that doesn't mean that all military means can be used. Of course, there are certain principles that you have to respect, the question of nonviolence against citizens and so on. But in the case of the occupier, it has no right to use military or any other means to sustain its occupation. Indeed, the occupier is supposed to follow international law, the Geneva Convention, as to what should be done with regard to protecting the occupied. However, there has been a very widespread framing of this war, as a, of this, uh, uh, the, what is happening, as a kind of war between Israel and the Palestinians, or a war between Israel and Gaza, a war between Israel and Hamas. And the point that has to be stressed here, and this is where there's a problem with international uh, law, is that you cannot talk about a colonizer carrying out a war against the colonized. You cannot talk about the occupier taking a war against that. This is very, very important because once you consider it to be a war, then you can advocate, oh, this is a war, but please Israel, be humane in how you carry this out and all. They have no right 
to do this. And one of the problems with international law wars, if you like, or humanitarian wars, is that they don't go into the question of the nature of the relationship between the two peoples who are at conflict. Being a, con a, a colonial, a, col a colonizer, colonized war and all that, we must recognize that to frame it as a war being done by Israel is, is something, it's a genocidal attack. It's a massacre. It's a brutality. It's all of these things. Huh? But don't dignify what they're doing by calling it a war that they're fighting, let alone this whole question of self-defense. question of people's resistance. Well, the settler colonial era, a regime which cannot do what the first type did, which was to eliminate uh, people, as it were, on a massive scale. The Palestinians will continue to struggle. And of course, the way that they struggle is another issue, but they will continue to struggle, and this creates pro great problems. We all want a ceasefire. It's not happening. What are the likely possibilities of what may emerge later on? Well, the point here is that the attempt to ethnically cleanse the Gazans into the Sinai doesn't seem to be likely to happen because of Egypt, although there are behind the scenes activities trying to do just that. More likely probably is that you will have a buffer zone in the north of Gaza and you will have a much denser, more miserable and more uh, uh, miserable and horrible uh, uh, closed and, and smaller cage prison for that. This, of course, is a very serious situation and we have to think about what to do. But I do think that you cannot separate the question of Palestine from what is happening in the wider region of the Middle East, North Africa, West Asia here. The struggle for the Palestinians must now be for rights and justice. And this is something that can unite the uh, Palestinians in Israel, the Palestinians in the um, uh, occupied territories, as well as the Palestinian diaspora. There are all kinds of rights, according to the Geneva Convention, according to the opposition to apartheid, the question of right of return. And all of these can unite these three forces. Plus, it also can connect with the struggle of ordinary people in the Arab dictatorships and the Iranian dictatorships to fight against their governments because their governments are not seriously committed, in my view, to the Palestinian cause. Uh, so I think that this direction now fighting for rights and justice by the Palestinian peoples of all kinds is the way to actually move uh, forward. But of course, the first thing that we have to do is that we do have to push as much as possible for a, a swift and permanent ceasefire. Mm. Uh, so this question of uh, international law, we appeal to international laws of here, but we must also recognize the limitations second class citizens and carry out a brutal occupation. Do not call what is war. It's crimes in the occupied territories are crimes against do not dignify the actors. And I think that's something that's very, very important that we have to understand. Thank you. Um, I, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Can you hear me, Professor? I've taken up all my 10 minutes, or is there some left? No, there, you still have a few minutes left. And I think, oh, uh, may I ask you another question then on rela in relation to the issue of law? Is where... Hmm. Where would international law then be present? Because the UN Security Council well, is deadlocked. So, where is this? Inter where would how would we make an international law? You know, be made operational along the lines that you're saying. Okay, how can we use what exists? Well, of course, is that we have a standard. The Geneva Convention, the, the, uh, the principles and laws with regard to occupied and occupied, those are things that we can certainly appeal to. The ICC, International Criminal Court, is different from the uh, International Court of Justice in the sense that even if you're not a member of that, you can be indicted and the ICC can indict and condemn individuals like presidents and generals and so on. 
Hmm? Now, the problem, of course, with the ICC being a the out, the punishment is limited, but it can certainly have a political effect if it is actually prepared to condemn the Tehau or to condemn others, uh, individual leaders, generals, and so on. Uh, impact. And that uh, on the question of the Security Council. Uh, and all that. Once again, because of the clash of the main powers in the Security Council, uh, what you can do, and that has some real value, of course, is when the General Assembly and others do indict uh, uh, Israel and do call for that. It has a political value. It's part of the process of raising and widening consciousness. And I think one thing we have to understand, because this is a long-term struggle for justice, is that political conflict is not above all a contest of arms or economic strength. It's a contest in which one side seeks to impose its will on the other side. But what happens when the side that is economically and militarily so much but has a will to resist oppression that is so wide and so deep that they will never give up? Then you raise the real possibility of a long-term victory. This is why the United States got defeated in Vietnam. This is why Russia got defeated in Afghanistan. And one of the remarkable things about the Palestinian people in the diaspora, as well as in the occupied territories in Israel, is that from generation to generation, they are carrying on the struggle for in, uh, injustice, against injustice. And lastly, the right of return. The importance of the right of return lies above all, not so much in the fact that they must come back or what. Those things can be negotiated, the compensation. The fact that it represents a very important political uh, principle, which goes beyond the law. And that is that how can the white apartheid regime and black North Africa have a new beginning? And the colonizer have a new beginning unless the colonizer and the apartheid regime accept that they were wrong. The, the importance of the right of return is for Israel to accept because by accepting it, they recognize that their very formation was a profound injustice to the Palestinian people. It is on that basis that you can talk of a future, this thing. So law, yes, but we also have to go out to fight for political uh, uh, principles and changing the relationship of forces politically also changes laws. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vinay. Now I'll, my, I have a question for Professor Ashker. Uh, what do you, in your view, what are the goals being pursued by Israel in this war? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, let me thank AEPF and uh, the organizers and, and you and Katerina for for hosting us, and uh, I'm glad to be sharing uh, this platform with uh, two good friends, Achin and Mamdouh. Um, uh, the, the goals, well, we, we have, I think, a, a classical uh, example of a, a predator state uh, seizing upon a, an opportunity to uh, fulfill a goal that uh, bears uh, finally uh, a little relation to this uh, to the opportunity and here the parallel has been made and i think it's clear in my mind that uh, 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 this is like the 911 moment for the united states when you had a bush administration full of uh, people who had been lobbying for the invasion of Iraq for uh, a few years, but uh, there were no uh, political conditions for that. And 9-11 uh, uh, offered them the opportunity uh, to, to go on a war spree, and that included the invasion of Iraq, even though Iraq had uh, zero relation with uh, what happened in 9-11. Um, so we have something like that happening, that uh, October 7 uh, was uh, seized upon by the uh, uh, Israeli state, uh, and especially the Israeli far right that is at the helm of that state and has been at the helm of that state for, for uh, many years now, 
but uh, getting even more to the far right than 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 uh, I mean year after year, uh, seizing the upon this opportunity to uh, uh, basically uh, uh, inflict uh, a huge. Uh, 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 and and uh, uh, traumatizing uh, uh, massacre upon the, the the Palestinian people. It has been called a genocide, and it has it bears the features of a genocide. Uh, uh, with the stated goal of eradicating Hamas, uh, a goal that can only be achieved uh, at the cost of a genocide, actually, and uh, the full destruction of uh, of the territory. Uh, because Hamas has been uh, uh, governing uh, the Gaza Strip since 2007. It's been uh, governing the, trips, the Strip since 16 years. It's been imp- rooted there politically for much longer. And therefore, what does it mean to eradicate an organization like that, which has been the state, if you want, the, the governments, the, 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 the ruling uh, uh, apparatus of, uh, of the territory for so many years? That 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 can only uh, translate into what we are witnessing, which is this uh, ongoing uh, genocidal massacre and the uh, uh, full destruction, the flattening of of uh, of uh, I mean major part of of the territory. And now uh, Gaza City is destroyed to to more than one third, and uh, and counting. This is continuing. Uh, the Israeli army progresses only after completely destroying the areas that it wants to to uh, invade, and that means uh, eventually a complete destruction of uh, of, of everything uh, in the, in the Gaza Strip. Now this is connected for uh, the Israeli far right with uh, an opportunity to fulfill uh, uh, their uh, wildest uh, projects of uh, of continuing what the Palestinians call the Nakba, referring to 1948, when the 80% of the Palestinians that were living in what became the state of Israel uh, fled the war and were never allowed to return. And that created the problem uh, of the Palestinian refugees. So 80% of the population fled the war and could never return, and their homes and lands and villages were seized, were uh, uh, confiscated by the Zionist uh, state. Uh, their villages were razed, hundreds of them. So that that was, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a really uh, 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 attempt at wiping off the, the the Palestinians from from their ancestral uh, land. And uh, now uh, the the far right that is uh, ruling Israel uh, uh, is uh, wishing to uh, complete what was done in 1948 by uh, uh, um, completely uh, controlling and annexing uh, the uh, uh, the remnant of Palestine between the river and the sea, that is the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Uh, emptying them from th- their population, displacing the population, what they call, what the Israeli far right call the transfer, and they, they mean by that the displacement, the forced displacement the exo- of, of, the, of the population, um, they, uh, and, uh, and therefore the annexation of these uh, territories. And uh, we, we can see the, uh, everything pointing in that direction in uh, uh, the way that uh, they are trying to push the Palestinian population uh, first from uh, North Gaza to the south of Gaza and then from there to Egypt. And they want them to go into Egyptian territory. And there uh, there was a a, a document from the Ministry of Intelligence of Israel uh, that was leaked a few days ago, uh, which very clearly uh, uh, spells out uh, the what it calls what it describes as the best scenario, which is uh, uh, expelling the Palestinian population into Egyptian territory, and set and having them settle there and build cities for them in the Sinai. That's the plan, uh, so that they 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 take full control of Gaza and uh, and uh, annex it. Now. 
uh, uh, this is the goal of the Israeli far right, and this Israeli far right uh, is dominant in the in the government, as you know, of Israel today. Uh, even Netanyahu, you know, hinted at at uh, at uh, this perspective by by saying that uh, Israel will be uh, uh, in charge of the security of of the the, the in Gaza uh, uh, for the indefinite uh, future. So. That's clearly what they are aiming at. Now, on the other hand, you have um, part of the opposition in Israel uh, and the United States of America. Uh, of course, all of them are backing this genocidal massacre. And that goes also, that applies to the all the Western states that uh, refuse to call for a ceasefire. Refusing to call for a ceasefire under these conditions is a direct complicity, direct uh, support for uh, uh, the massacre that is going on. Now, uh, the United States and, as I said, part of the Israeli uh, opposition uh, uh, would like to uh, uh, revive the Oslo, <clears throat> the Oslo framework of, uh, of, uh, of, of so-called settlement um, by handing over the uh, power in the Gaza Strip uh, to the Palestinian Authority that is now in the West Bank in Ramallah, and in order to give the you know the impression the the illusion I would say that uh, there is some semblance of uh, of a Palestinian state that uh, that uh, could be created in that way uh, as a as a actually uh, as a as a way to to basically liquidate the the basic Palestinian cause. Uh, but with a, a rump state, a rump entity called a state, which would be no more than a Bantustan, as they used to call them in South Africa, under full control of the Israeli, uh, the Israeli state. So uh, what is happening, therefore, is is on the ground. They are all moving in a direction that is committing the uh, committing a, a genocidal massacre and trying to expel the population. Uh, and 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 then you have those disagreements between them as to the final, the end game, where where they would be heading. But what they are doing on the ground uh, serves the first, not the second. Uh, what they are doing on the ground serves the 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 far right's uh, uh, project, uh, and it, it goes against any any perspective of any kind of settlement. Uh, of political settlement between the Israeli state and the Palestinians. On the contrary, it is making this uh, 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 tragedy even uh, more uh, uh, tense than ever before. And that's what we have to, to, to be uh, uh, aware of. Thank you, Professor Ashkar. Now a question for Mr. Habashi. What are the regional and global responses to the war in terms of seeking rights, seeking justice, um, yes, and, 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 and addressing the historical injustices that have been infiltrated in the Palestinian people? Okay, first of all, like others, thank you, Shaman, thank you, Katharine, thank you all for organizing this webinar and giving us the chance to talk. Um, um, I think are uh, witnessing now uh, a new degree or a new stage of polarization all over the world that have never been before like this. And I mean polarization between peoples on one hand and the imperialists on the other hand. And now, I have to refer to one of the major, um, uh, I would call it things, of uh, our comrade Samir Amin, who redefined colonial imperialism in our times. It means after the Second World War. Uh, before the Second World War, we have a very clear definition of imperialist countries that all of them have been fighting against each other to redivide the cake. But after the Second World War, 
we have a new order, especially appeared after the so-called new uh, post-war era between 45 and 75, that we have the so-called collective colonialism. That means the global south, the streets of the centers against the global north in general. And that's what we are now witnessing and what these co collective colonialism is trying to uh, to uh, to vanish, to, to disappear behind and, and, and make another propaganda with very different narratives. Such crimes like we are witnessing in Gaza now um, uh, waken up the entire world and I pretend now the world before uh, October 7th will never be like the world after October 7th in this meaning. That means this kind of polarization we are witnessing now is a part or an important element of the global struggle uh, north against south and will affect it significantly and will be affected of it also. And I don't think that the Palestinian cause will be solved under these conditions because now, as uh, Gilbert has mentioned, the, 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 the situation is unbalanced and asymmetric and so on. So the balance of power between the states is very disturbed now. So um, in this context, also, on the Arab region, we can observe where are the Arab regimes are, uh, putting themselves on which camp of these poles. Uh, it is obvious that all over the Arab countries, the peoples are demonstrating for Palestine, and the regimes are hiding behind uh, titles that are faked all and, and uh, uh, even known by, by everybody that are not true in order not to help because I pretend that all these Arab regimes, I think without exception, um, they are very interested in killing once and for all the entire Palestinian cause. Not only Hamas. Hamas is only one element of this uh, uh, resistance. They don't want to have resistance in Palestine. They want to have a very calm region uh, to continue their plans, sell everything to the central states. Egypt is one of these most clear examples of that. Uh, that uh, countries in Latin America put uh, uh, out the uh, Israeli ambassador, but not even one Arab country, maybe, but uh, only Jordan, mm -hmm. they could stop uh, the relations with the, uh, the Israeli genocide. So, and especially in Europe, we can see now a new awakenings in the recognition of these double standard policies. And I, I, I mean, in, in, in the countries of the global south in general, people are aware about these uh, double standard policies. But now the peoples of Western Europe are recognizing this for sure. It's a process. It is not uh, just by one event. Huh? But now they are starting to see how these so-called um, uh, rule-based uh, regimes or value-based regimes, they can, uh, they can ignore all their values when they want to, uh, to put on special policy. Um, in, in the context of the Arab region, especially in Palestine, I would like to mention that um, this uh, war 
started by the Aqsa uh, Club have um, a great impact on unifying even not only the Palestinian uh, camp of the resistance, but even all Arab, other Arab, Arab uh, left parties. Because um, all of them, they have been waiting for this uh, for this start, I would call it start, waiting for a resistance that can be affecting the, the struggle. And not only uh, shouting and condemning and, and accepting killings and uh, uh, and giving uh, concessions and uh, accepting uh, conditions and uh, all over the time. For the first time, they can feel that they are capable to, to hurt the aggressor. And this is a new era. And this makes uh, the ideological differences being secondary. That means, for sure, I am not a fan of Hamas as uh, um, an Islamist, Islamist movement and so on. I am not a fan of Hezbollah as well. Um, or, or, or the the Houthis in Yemen. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to a real resistance, all of them will be backing the resistance. It's not about Hamas. It's about the resistance in the entire area. And it's not only about Palestine. Um, last but not least, let me um, continue what uh, my friend Gilbert as mentioned, which is very important, about um, the, the the plans of uh, kicking the Palestinians out to, to Sinai. Um, this is a plan, and it has been published and uh, first time mentioned by our president in the United Nations meeting, uh, talking to President uh, uh, Trump, asking him, he is the only strong president with whom we can realize the so-called deal of the century. And this expression comes not from me, but from our president. And deal of the century is exactly what Gilbert has described. That means deal of the century solving the, the, the Palestinian issue by getting rid of all Palestinians in the occupied territories, including Gaza for sure, and the West Bank, getting them out, pushing them to Sinai and to Jordan, and realizing this um, illusion, the dream of uh, the big Israel and so on. And I have to say, nobody knows that, but it is a fact, and you can show, see it and, 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 and observe, uh, the Egyptian regime has already prepared the area for the Palestinians inside and made uh, 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 logistics and uh, infrastructure and building homes and uh, make a, a, a fence around a piece of land near to Gaza, uh, expecting uh, uh, receiving era of this struggle. But now the regime is not capable to confess that. They have even our regime in Egypt, they have evacuated this area in Sinai from, uh, from its uh, uh, original uh, Egyptian uh, citizens that have been always living there. Now they are they have been kicked out in order to make this area free for to, to, to re receive the, the Palestinians. So, deal of the century is made, and exactly that is what uh, are now going to, to, uh, to execute, but they will not succeed, because this is, um, I mean, too obvious for everybody. No. Um, I think I'm now, by the 10 minutes, but there is a lot to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Habashi. Thank you.
Um, now, I, we have some questions already on the chat. Um, Mr. Nasim Malik had asked if he would be allowed to ask his question, a short question. He and uh, Mr. Nasim, do you want to take the floor very quickly, please? Or do you want to type your question in here? I cannot see all the participants. I can only see the panelists. So I'm requesting my colleagues uh, who are doing handling the technology to be able to let us know. Uh, no. Ah, there's Mr. Nasim Malik. Yes, Mr. Malik, please put up, put on your. Uh, Please turn on your record. Yes. A short question, please. Thank you you have a question? Yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Please ask yes. your question. M my question is, uh, thank you very much. I have a lesson to everyone. I'm Nassim Malik. From, I'm the General Secretary of the International Human Rights Committee residing in uh, Sweden. Uh, we should realize, you know, I, I understand, realize and recognize the critical need of the hour. We must accept that peace can only be built upon the solid foundations of honesty, integrity, and justice. These are the keys to peace until there is honesty and justice, no solution will ever prove beneficial. So my question is just very simple. If the word United Nations superpowers are honest, and they have justice in their mind to solve this Palestinian problem? If they have this from the very beginning? Otherwise, we will see that this happening all the time. If we are not honest, if we are not uh, uh, bring the justice in it, so the things will go on. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Malik. So what I'm going to do is, I, there are other questions in the chat. Since we are on Facebook Live also, I will read the questions out. And then I will come back to all the speakers for your responses. And you can... But, uh, Mr. Achin has not spoken yet. No? He has. He has already I, spoken. Okay. Yeah. He spoke first. Yeah. Um, okay. So this uh, what there's a question from uh, Rai Sarib. The question is, what Israel is doing in Gaza could be understood as an act of defense, or is it rather an act of collective punishment? Okay, could you hear that question? So with, I, I'm, I'm going to read out the questions for the Facebook Live people also. Okay, then there is another question by Mr. Muhammad Kamarullah, who is saying, how can you expect peace between two unequal states without changing the mindset of the oppressor? So this is a question really along the lines of what uh, Professor Vinayak was already saying in his, uh, in his first uh, initial remarks. Then there's a question from Ruth Bilena. Uh, so she's saying, oh, she said, oh, it, it was to do with, uh, with, 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 she's saying that the sound reception isn't particularly good on her end. So I don't, there's no other comment there. Then there is a question from Mahanaz Rahman. The question is, the injustice done to Palestinians in 1948 is the root cause of most conflicts that the world is facing today. So from which platform can we raise voices for justice for Palestinians? The UN is not able to do anything because of American pressure. And then there is a question from Shukla Sen. How to stop Israel from achieving its goal of affecting a far larger expulsion of the Palestinians uh, then has already been achieved as yet. So this is actually related quite di very directly to the point also that uh, Professor Ashkar was raising. And finally, the uh, oh, there are still two more questions. Sorry, I'll just read them all out so you can respond to them. And then the Muhammad Arfan is asking, 
how does the panel view the option of the two state resolution? I mean, the two state, yeah, uh, the two state resolution. How do you, what are your views on that? And Mr. Wahid Bhatti has some comments or saying that um, the superpower will, do we really believe that the superpower will ever be uh, honest and his, his, he's saying no, no, no. Anyway, so you've got the questions. Um, why don't we come, before I take any more, why don't we go back to the panel and hear your responses? So let's go back to Professor Vinayak first. Please, Achin, your response to any of the questions. It seems to me there's an overlap between the questions and three broad points have come up. One, of course, is this question of um, how do we change the mindset of the oppressor? How do we do that here? And related to how to change the situation. And here's very simple. You have to change the relationship of forces in order to change the mindset over here. And how can that be done? It means you have to have a much wider struggle and one of the directions from which you could have a very significant shift in the way people thinking is if one of the dictatorships in the Arab world were to fall as a result of a struggle from outside. That's why I stress the point about the struggle for rights and justice and greater democracy is something that can connect across the region here. That is something that can seriously affect uh, the changes. So you, you recognize this importance of changing the relationship of forces here. Another question had to do with the question of self-defense and uh, and collective punishment. Forget the idea that Israel is doing something and needs to do something in self-defense. We're talking about the most powerful armed army in the region. You're talking about it having nuclear weapons. You're talking about it being backed by the most powerful military force in the world. There is this myth of the perpetual victimhood of Israel. And we have to constantly attack that myth of the perpetual victimhood by pointing that out here. This also connects with the point about the collective punishment alone. You see, this is where the danger of framing it as a kind of war that Israel is doing and therefore it's right to self-defense or collective punishment. Does it mean that if you are opposed to Israel's collective punishment, you are entitled, uh, Israel is entitled to selective punishment by what it's doing, by bombing and killing and all the rest of it? I mean, breaking houses, going off specifically after uh, uh, Hamas, which has not just a military wing, but a proselytizing wing, a municipal wing, an educational wing, a social welfare wing, and you just lump all of them together and you don't bother about anything and then you say, you just go ahead and do this? This business of collective punishment is part of the so-called rules of war, that you're supposed to fight war in a certain way. My point about what Israel is doing is that you do not justify or dignify it by calling it a war, which is doing that. It's far, it's a genocidal campaign, which is utterly unjustified. What do they do about the uh, individual Hamas uh, people who are responsible for the attack on civilians? You provide evidence internationally about who they are and, uh, and you go for that specifically, selectively in a calm manner, using intellectual, uh, inter, uh, international support of various kinds. It's what the Palestinians have to do when they, uh, when there is the killing of uh, by Israeli soldiers of Palestinians here, they actually provide video evidence, but they get away with it. So you have to uh, yeah. so I think uh, we have an I think issue. what was the what was the third. Uh, uh, there was a question on how to stop Israel from achieving its goal of affecting a far larger expulsion of the Palestinians. Yeah. Sorry, Achin, we, we, your, I think your uh, connection yeah. isn't very, very good. Let me just... Speak. Yeah, about Palestinians, yeah. Well, yeah, it's very. It's going to be very difficult to expel the Palestinians uh, in Gaza, for example, into the uh, into Egypt, or a greater degree of the West Bank, uh, uh, Palestinians into Jordan, unless you are able to get support from the Jordanian and the Egyptian governments. And therefore, the focus in preventing that has to be very much on that. 
and working with progressive forces in those countries as well as other progressive forces or governments to uh, to ensure that they they don't accept that kind uh, that kind of approach would be to play into the hands as for the two state one state this is something for the palestinians uh, to decide i do have my personal view but palestinians are also divided but the transition for a long period of time without getting into what is most desirable two state one state is the fight for rights equality justice that very struggle can shift the relationship forces if in my view largely through non violent processes and struggles yes a place for self defense arms of self defense but you cannot defeat uh, uh, israel military if you're going to change the minds of people you have to fight in a much more systematic way for these things which have appeal internationally in fact people like thomas friedman and all who are very pro uh, american imperialism if you like saying my god if the uh, palestinians start fighting for equal rights and democracies that's going to be much more difficult for us to cope with that so i think that's a very important thing of course it's very easy for me as a non palestinian to say fight in the uh, air but there are palestinians who are saying that and who are saying that we have to move in this particular direction uh, to to bring uh, bring this about it's a long term struggle but as i said before uh, if you connect the struggles in different parts uh, of, the, of, the, of the middle east with the palestinian struggle if you connect it to the struggle in the uh, israel itself against apartheid uh, remember it was uh, uh, the struggle against apartheid if you like if it's prioritized is also the way to struggle for decolonization and my own inclination of course is towards um, uh, moving uh, in a more equal rights for all within a one state but okay Th thank you professor inak i'm going to move to professor ashkar now professor ashkar please over to you Yes, thank you. Um, well, I'll address first the, I mean, the the issue of uh, what uh, what uh, could be done at the level of of states uh, in in what is going on. Uh, uh, there much more could be done, and I'll start with the the Arab states. The the resolution that they sponsored at the United Nations is far below uh, the, the the what uh, the kind of condemnation. and position that is requested uh, under such circumstances and we should note that uh, these states uh, and uh, those among them who are oil exporters uh, oil and gas exporters have a tremendous leverage with that which they are not using uh, mamdouh and myself have signed a, a recent petition uh, uh calling on these governments or shaming these governments uh for not uh, uh, uh stopping the oil and gas exports as they did in 1973 well in 1973 they were ready to be in solidarity with their friend anwar sadat who was a uh, uh, president of of egypt uh they are not willing to do anything like this for the palestinians and that, that shows of course the nature of uh, of these regimes which were Uh, most of them engage in uh, in uh, so called normalization with the uh, with the israeli state and uh, uh, more could be done at the un level including uh, by circumventing the uh, uh, the veto at the uh, security council there are there is a mechanism at the un which uh, was created at the time of the korean war to circumvent the security council and get the general assembly vote on uh, binding resolutions that's called united for peace and uh, no one has uh, moved this forward but they could so if there were states uh, in at the un who were really willing to 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 act uh, in support of the palestinian and to stop the genocide the ongoing genocide there are means that have not been Uh, uh used until now at the uh, at the at those levels there are means at the the level of the arab oil exporters uh and all this could have tremendous impact on on the global situation and would certainly have led had the arab oil exporters uh, uh started a new boycott that would certainly have led the western governments Uh, to uh, revise their kind of position or act uh, with more urgency to stop the killing 
Now, uh, as a second, uh, just comment um, on the uh, uh, the two state solution. Well, the Palestinians have defined in uh, 2006 uh, uh, a consensual position of all this, the the fractions, all the parties, uh, from Hamas to Fatah, everyone that was started by the Palestinian prisoners. And that included uh, uh, the, the, what the Palestinian society regards as minimal demands, which included therefore the complete withdrawal of the occupation from all the territories occupied 1967, the dismantlement of the settlements, the dismantlement of the wall, the separation wall built by the Israeli state, the uh, also the end of the annexation of Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, and the return of the refugees. So these are the minimal demands of the Palestinians. And uh, well, if 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 such demands were implemented, the Palestinians, uh, including Hamas, by the way, would would be willing uh, to consider a, a two-state solution. But anything short of that is is just a sham. Is a dupery. It is just. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a way of, of of trying to get the the Palestinians accept some some sham, some bantustan, and only a, a very uh, discredited and uh, degenerate uh, uh, part of the Palestinian, like the Palestinian Authority, could accept such uh, such deals. The 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 the, the, the pop Palestinian population, the Palestinian people, cannot accept, cannot be satisfied with such deals. Now, eventually, of course, uh, uh, as we should always say, this whole thing is about the, the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. That is the right to decide by themselves what they want. As I said, in 2006, they very much, very clearly spelled out their uh, minimal demands, the, the, the conditions, their minimal requirements. And, uh, and they are the only people who can uh, really uh, decide on these matters. Thank you, Professor Ashkar. Mr. Habashi, over to you. Whatever, yes. Whichever questions you would I, like to respond to. Uh, yes, I would like to continue what you uh, have started. The, the solution of the Palestinian cause in general, we have to accept the fact that it is a long struggle. It is not going to be solved after uh, this uh, war. Uh, it will take time because it needs the awakening of new awareness in the minds, not only in the Arab world, but worldwide. And this is a long process which should take place for sure on a peaceful way. But the main goal is to dismantle the Western narratives, these big lies that um, led us and led the world to the situation we are suffering now. These, such as, as an example, everybody is um, condemning or attacking the policies of the state of Israel is anti Semite. So, this is a big lie. The other thing is. Uh, for instance, um, that the Jews came to Palestine and found it without people and said, uh, people without land in a land without people. We have to know, all of us, and also in the minds of the rest of the world, that this state of Israel is originally a colonial project, and a colonial project uh, chosen, elected, and planned by the colonial power at that time, and they had uh, they had used the, uh, the fact of the oppression of the Jews and the so-called uh, Jews question as a, an opportunity to achieve these colonial goals in the nineteenth century. So, uh, these narratives should be dismantled 
in the mines, and this is the long process until uh, a huge and enough uh, uh, movement worldwide can support uh, the, the Palestinian groups. One of the issues in the questions are about the two-state solution. I personally think, and I have been uh, supported by also uh, Israeli intellectuals, very fine uh, definition about this so-called two-state solution has never been accepted for one minute by any of the Israeli governments, even in 93, even after signing the, the, the Oslo agreement. No, it was just to win time until they continue in the original plan that have been mentioned by, by Gilbert, the big Israel and, and uh, this narrative. So, uh, therefore, they have worked uh, constantly to, to, to destroy this dream of two-state uh, solution. And the world, I mean, the states in the United States, and they have been hanging on this two-state solution, although all of them know it is not practicable, it is not doable. And now, more than ever before, it is not doable, and everybody knows that. So, the one it is since uh, almost uh, fifteen years, the only solution is the one-state democratic solution, uh, in which all citizens can live together with the same rights and the same duties. And we have an example in South Africa as an apartheid regime, and it would take uh, perhaps generations to have it uh, together now, a new, uh, new kind of society. But this is the only solution, the only possible solution that also can be accepted by the rest of the world. No, but it is not accepted by the colonial powers, by the imperialists. This is not accepted. And reasons they can tell what. But, you know, this uh, growing of hate on both sides will never have an end. Only with this kind of solution. And this state of a two, one, one state solution um, can be only done when the decision fails and, and, and said, okay, this is the only way to solve this. Many of the Western, they describe the Arabs as those uh, criminals and uh, terrorists that want to throw uh, Israel, Israel uh, in, the, in the sea. They want to finish Israel. But this is a big difference between we don't want the state of Israel but we have to live with this third generation born in this country and consider it its home. And therefore, they have to live with them and everybody accepts them. Yeah. The yeah. state is an organization among the people. We don't want the state of Israel under this right. uh, criminal ideology. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Habashi. I'm sorry, uh, I do. Uh, there will take. There are some more questions, and uh, before I come back to Katrina for the closing remarks, I'll just read them quickly, and I'd request all of all the speakers to make just very short responses, one or two minutes, uh, on those. Uh, the one one question is from Imtia Zalam: How to build how to build a broadest coalition to defend Palestinian rights and dispel the propaganda warfare, which terms Palestinian resistance as anti-Semitism and terrorism while granting absolute right to defense to the occupier by committing Jewish genocide and brutal re-annexation. Why not go back to the Oslo process while strengthening PA? So this is a question about how to build the broadest coalition to defend Palestinian rights and dispel you know, this uh, 
propaganda warfare, etc. So the distinction and also a question then about the Oslo Accords, whether why, uh, why we can go back to those. And then there's a point from Mr. Wahid Bhatti that the conflict has been cleverly positioned as a fight between Muslims, Muslims and Israel and the rest. So Muslims on one side and Israel and the rest on one side. It has been falsely turned into a question of preserving Western Christian and Jewish values. It must be clear to the world that that is not the case. So it's not a question, it's a, it's a comment. Mr. Nassim Malik still wants to get a yes or no answer to his question about whether the United Nations and superpowers who have veto are honest and are they doing justice to Palestine? Yes or no? He wants to still get that response from you. And finally, there is a point from Ms. An Mr. Anwen saying in Germany, the conflict is picked up by migrant Arab and Palestinian communities, creating anti-Semite and party, part, partly violent demonstrations. Many folks are influenced by propaganda from violent organizations from Palestine, but they also use narratives that de derive from post-colonial thinking tradition. Talking about neocolonialism and racism that is being practiced, which is in part true, but not in the context they're using the arguments. So the problem is that they are calling violent actions in public, they're calling for violent actions in public and are spreading anti-Semitism. How can we avoid that terrorist parts of Hamas and other militant organizations, um, how can we avoid that they abuse the narratives of the post-colonial thinking tradition? So this is a much uh, longer question. I know these are all complex questions, so I request all of you to just give really short Please, uh, one or two minute answers each. Uh, Achin, please, first to you again. Achin, we don't hear you. Your mic's off, I think. Achin, your mic is off. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the UN, there is the Good Works Department, which is there, and you have the political system in which the Security Council dominates and, of course, is divided and is not going to move, but Gilbert has actually pointed out that something could be done in the General Assembly. And that is where the pressure you can have to at least push for a binding uh, resolution of some sort here. On the question of uh, uh, anti-Semitism and post-colonial thinking and all that, uh, and about Islam, let's be very clear. The main problem is the socialization that is done by all kinds of civil society organizations and groups and bodies outside of governments that actually is cultivating this idea of the link between uh, Islam and terrorism and hiding the reality that it, this is something much more widespread. And that the biggest problem is not the narrative of uh, anti-Semitism, as uh, Madhu Habashi has pointed out here. The biggest problem is the rationalization of just, uh, justification of what Israel is doing in the name of fighting anti-Semitism. And this is where you have to have a counter process in civil society that generates more and more support. Uh, and I'm happy to say that at least in civil society, more and more people are seeing that this is a fraud. But we have to influence the journalistic community, the media here. Yeah. And the social media can be used as a force for both good and bad. It's ironic. In some countries, it's the right that dominates the social media. In some other countries, it's the liberals and the left that dominate the social media. And above all, it's a question of mobilization and, 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 and demonstrations and struggles that helps to change things. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vinayak. Professor Ashkar. Um, yes. Uh, well, uh, f first about uh, this issue of, uh, of uh, describing Hamas as a terrorist organization. Uh, uh, I mean, Hamas is a resistance organization, and it has been also in power in the Gaza Strip, as we said, for 16 years. So how can an organization of, of this kind uh, fighting against an, what is an occupation by international law? I mean, uh, even the United States recognizes that Gaza and the West Bank, not only the West Bank, are occupied. Their status is occupied by international law. How can an organization like this be described as terrorist. This is something we know. In the history of colonial, anti-colonial struggle, always the anti-colonial fighters have been described by ter as terrorists by the colonial powers. 
I mean, you look at all of that, you will see that, including also, of course, the resistance against the Nazi occupiers in Europe. They were called terrorists by the Nazis. So we should we should uh, fight against so, such characterizations. That doesn't mean that I, one endorses Hamas. I, I do not share Hamas's ideology in the least. I'm a left-wing person. Hamas is a right-wing organization. Uh, 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 and uh, I do not condone every act that Hamas does. Some acts are acts that I see legitimate. Some acts may, may not be. But if we are speaking of terrorism, the 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 we we should start first by the terrorism of the state of Israel. State terrorism has killed in history much 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 more more people than than any any non-state terrorism, and so the 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 major terrorist in this uh, uh, conflict is the Israeli state. It has been practicing terror against the Palestinians for decades, terror occupation deprivation. Uh, uh, usurpation of land and the rest. That's the key point. And uh, and if uh, I mean the, the 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 exploitation, the instrumentalization of the Holocaust, and the the Jewish, uh, the European Jewish question is a very hypocritical way of uh, of 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 lending support to the terrorism of the state of Israel. There is no relation. If if anyone wants to draw the right lessons from the uh, what happened to the Jews in Europe, well, this the right lessons are to be against occupation, against discrimination, against racism, against uh, everything that the Israeli state is doing today. That I mean, that's and that's I mean, it's good that many Jewish uh, uh, activists and thinkers uh, clearly see that in the name of the Holocaust, they reject what the Israeli state is doing, and they say not in our name. They refuse the Israeli state to to pretend to speak in the name of uh, of all the Jews uh, of uh, of the world. And a final just point: the broad coalition is there. It's a, on the basis of international law, uh, uh, and uh, and the European and the Western states and the United States supporting today Israel in what is is doing are violating international law. International law starts by recognizing there is an occupation and demanding the end of the occupation. You start by that. You don't support the occupier going again into the, the occupied land and, and committing a, a genocide as we see today. So it is on the basis of international law that a, a, a broad coalition can be, can be built. And this international law is there for everyone to see and everyone to support if they wish. Yes, thank you, Professor Ashkar. Now, uh, Mr. Habashi, two minutes, Max, please. Yes, I don't have much to add after did that. Uh, I just want to mention one simple thing. Uh, as I said, it is a long process. And as uh, our colleague Ajin said, um, it is about mobilization worldwide. But the main issue is to uh, to grow this awareness that the conflict there is not about religion at all. It is about occupation. Yeah. And this is something which is not clear at all among European minds, West yeah. European minds, at least. This is number one. And I can mention quite a lot of Jews, intellectuals, who, can, uh, who, who, who exactly explain this in our sense, that's like Miko Pellet or Gideon Levy or Norman Finkelstein, uh, all of them, they have written exactly that, what Gilbert has mentioned. The other thing is about anti-Semitism. Um, for sure, we cannot re deny that in this oifery and history of war, there are some on the Arab uh, camp that see the issue as a religion uh, war, especially on this Islamic uh, camp. Mm -hmm. And this is for sure to, to criticize, but not to blame, because we have to understand the situation under which they are fighting now. Yeah? Sure. We have uh, such uh, 
distorted awareness and uh, consciousness, but within the process, all these kinds of distortion will disappear. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Habashi, Professor Vinayak, and Professor Ashkar. Uh, I now will ask, request Katerina to give us some summarizing remarks and other remarks uh, before we move to closer, uh, close the event. Katerina, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers. I actually find it difficult uh, to speak as last uh, after all of you, but uh, okay, I will try. Let me start by saying that every sane person that understands the value of human life condemns what happened on the 7th of October. Yes, every sane person. And um, I know that it's uh, always a demand right now when uh, racialist people, black and brown people talk about the conflict, you kind of feel obliged to the first thing you do when you start talking is uh, condemn Hamas. For the listeners, I am a Greek living in Austria, uh, but I am the grandchild of people that have been occupied by Germany, of partisans that have been killed and have been persecuting that time. I'm not Jewish. Um, and the confession of my family was Christian, but I'm pretty much aware of the horrors of uh, the Shoah, and I'm pretty much aware of the horrors of the Israeli occupation towards the Palestinian people. Because I, I, I wanted to start um, this summarization by addressing what I consider to be, uh, from the European perspective, the main point. And this is the double standards, the double standards with which Europeans uh, tend to see and describe the world. It's very important. And right now, because of this conflict, they're becoming more evident than ever. Um, I don't know if you remember, but the, when the bombings of Gaza started, um, a video of uh, the commissioner, um, Van der Leyen started circulating where she was condemning the bombing of civilian infrastructure and civilians through Russia on Ukraine soil, but she was unable to do so when it came to the hospitals in Gaza, to ambulances and the civil infrastructure that is practically made flat in the north of the Gaza Strip. Um, part of the, uh, except this, there have been many comments of many politicians and um, I, I would like in these 10 minutes to try to look into that as well. What is the situation in which the discourse is taking place in Europe and how does uh, the political leadership of European countries and to be honest, the most important European countries because also within Europe, there is a periphery that is quite big. Uh, how do they deal with the issue? We have to, yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, Greece is quite small. Eh? We are a part of the European Union, but of course we don't have the same uh, the same weight, the same political weight as Germany and France. It is important um, to understand that right now the pro-Israel position is uh, growing through all political families except the left in Europe. You have the Greens, Social Democrats, uh, the Conservatives, and even the far right, supporting the state of Israel in what it's doing, hiding behind the argument of self-defense, neglecting the occupation, the occupation of the West Bank, the occupation of Gaza, and also the millions of Palestinians that are already refugees for many, many decades. So this kind of um, serves um, the notion that exists in Europe that security comes with militarization. Uh, and this is connected also to capital interests. I mean, it's something also that needs to be spoken about. For years, the securitization of Europe uh, comes in hand uh, with militarization, externalization of borders, bilateral agreements with very questionable regimes uh, in order to, what they say, curve migration. The dominant myth right now in Europe is we're going to lose our privilege because black and brown people are coming to get us. Um, the far right is something that started 20 years ago as a far right conspiracy. This depopulation of Europe and the replacement of the white race has now uh, hegemony, I would say, not within the peoples of Europe, but within the European elites that are governing us. And in this context, this war is red and it is important to understand. Now, when it comes to the German speaking countries, particularly actually Germany and Austria, um, the discourse is even more distorted than in other countries. 
um, because of the Shoah, their responsibility of the Shoah, they are unable, unable to express any kind of healthy criticism towards the state of Israel. They neglect the fact, for example, that the Netanyahu government has been the most contested government of the last 30 years. The demonstrations that have been happening the last two years against this government, the fact that this person has been indicted by an Israeli court uh, for corruption, that he does not have support, the, the racist remarks they're doing, the consequent dehumanization of Palestinians, all these things do not play a role in the dominant discourse of the governments. But they do play a role when it comes to social movements that are not willing to accept these double standards, that are trying to find a way to articulate their disagreement to this to this double standards. And it's not easy to do. Um, the reality in Germany is also as described by the commentator, but um, in this comment, one part is neglected, the Jewish voices. The Jewish German people that are silenced right now, that are going on TV and saying, hey, you uh, pretend uh, from the, the side of the German government to, to address the interests of all Israelis, but we're telling you we're Israeli Jewish citizens and we do not agree with what's going on. And then you have, um, you know, really absurd discussions uh, funded with accusations of auto anti Semitism. This is all a very, very toxic climate. And there is, of course, this continuous discourse on the polarization of society. Now, mm -hmm. I think it is important when we have these discussions to a little bit try to demask this, let's say, mechanisms of propaganda that, pre you know, when you hear the, the, the word polarization, you automatically somehow think there is a 50-50. Uh, there is a 50-50 opinion. The opinion is very, very polarized. I dare to say that uh, the majority of Europeans are not okay with the bombardment and annihilation of the peoples of Gaza, are not okay with children and civic infrastructure being killed every, every day. But it is very difficult to articulate this position. On the political level now, part of demonstrations being banned, like in France, people still take the street and uh, try somehow to become vocal against the occupation. But we see it in the UN uh, that all this does not reflect in what the governments are doing. Uh, the country I live in, Austria, is a neutral country. They actually didn't abstain by the last resolution asking for a ceasefire. They voted against it. Um, the day that the bombardment started, they picked up the, the Israeli flag and they hanged it over the, the city council of Vienna, a city that has been governed by social democrats for over 100 years. So um, I want to lay this down because I think it is important to understand also how the discourse is taking place in Europe and every one of us understands why it is important that, that this changes in Europe. Another thing um, I wanted to, to address, and I think maybe for the people that don't live in Europe is important to understand all this discussion around anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism exists in Europe. But the dominant politics now um, create a myth of imported, imported uh, anti-Semitism that comes together with the refugees within the walls of Europe, neglecting the fact that in Germany, the IFD party, a Nazi, neo-Nazi, neo-fascist party is um, carrying the polls with a 30 percent, with a projection of 30 percent for the next election. Shame goes for Austria. The FPÖ, the 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 far right party in Austria with deeply connections to, to, to the Nazi regime, with structures, intellectuals still existing there, anti-Semites to the bone, uh, they are neglected because anti-Semitism right now is imported because everything that criticizes the state of Israel is automatically considered anti-Semitic. This is going to be a very, very big fight, very big struggle to counter this narrative, but it is ongoing. I want to come with some hope and say it is ongoing. I think it is also important, I'm a little bit outside what has been discussed now, but to, to reflect the militarization of the European border and Europe's migration politics on what is happening right now. Within the context of the conflict between uh, Israel and Hamas, Right now, uh, one European country after the other 
tries to establish bilateral agreements like uh, Italy has with Libya, uh, like the UK not being part of the European Union, but very much European in the in the political context has with Rwanda. Now we have the Italian government having a um, an agreement with Italy, the Austrian prime minister flying to the UK, signing a security agreement with the UK on the Rwanda model. Um, the conflict right now is instrumentalized by people that are racist, by a racist border regime in order to attack, target, racialized people. Black and brown people right now are under attack, not only Palestinians. Uh, the conf this conflict reflects throughout the whole Muslim community in Europe. There are people that are really afraid to take their children to school. You have graffitis in Europe uh, saying Muslims raus, Muslims should go out. And it's really, really, really scary. Um, and, the, and the palette, let's say, of defense, uh, Europeans of uh, with a Muslim re religion or um, a Middle Eastern uh, or a Maghreb even descent is very, very small. There are very little things they can do. Fortunately, and I want to close with that, and this is a um, plaidoyer, fortunately, there are a lot, thousands of um, Jewish European citizens and Jewish Israeli European citizens that oppose what is going on. And I think a first step towards peace and justice should be finding contact to these communities, joining forces with these communities, also in the streets, and try to break this people um, that is, in my opinion, um, instrumentalized of you're either pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian. You cannot be for peace. If you're for, for peace, you are naive. We have to break this. We have to be present with this way uh, on the streets. There are efforts uh, towards this in Austria and in Germany. And yes, in this long struggle, it is very important to put human rights and justice in the center, and we will see how this turns out. Um, I think this is enough for now. I don't know yeah. if there is a question, but I think it was important to understand the, the European context and how this is taking place right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina. Oh. And uh, I this is really much appreciated. We really needed to hear uh, these views uh, from you and also about you know understanding not just your views but your analysis of what's happening with Europe and how uh, you know people across the spectrum are responding uh, not just to the I mean to the war but also to the occupation and how it links to other historical acts of oppression and occupation and genocide that have happened. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions or any more remarks. We've reached at the end of our time. And I just want to thank all of you um, for joining us for this dialogue and for all the important, uh, you know, all the important insight and analysis you have shared with us. I thank the participants. Um, as all of you have said, this is a very long struggle. It's not going to, I mean, this is a very long struggle. For, of course, it's been a very long struggle for the Palestinians already, but it's also a long struggle forward in terms of um, self-determination, peace, even getting a ceasefire and breaking the kind of uh, racism that has gridlocked into the international community and the international law. So I have confidence that we will continue to work together and build solidarity as we need. And thank you again very much. And I, I wish thank you. I wish you all the best and wish peace and good health and solidarity to everybody. Thank you.